Hello, everybody. My name is Eli Lehrer, and I'm president of the Arsenal Institute. We're a right of center think tank located here in Washington, DC. And I'd like to welcome you to our event offering perspectives on the Electoral College. In my own work over the years, much of it with our good friends at ALEC, I've long been interested in the Electoral College and the way we as a nation select a president. As I am the moderator and obligated to be impartial, I do want to be clear that my own views are in favor of retaining the current system in much the way it now exists. I want to be upfront about this because if I seem biased in favor of my own views, please call me on it. That said, I believe the questions we're dealing with are close ones that go to the heart of major and important values at the heart of our democracy. There are good arguments on both sides. Everyone should acknowledge that no system will always result in good choices and that the current system has not always produced the best leaders. So the question is not, is our system perfect? But rather, is it the best we can do? The system we have today, where we hold 51 separate elections for president, 48 of which are decided on a winner-take-all basis, the other two by congressional district, is the process of evolution of a constitutional system that ultimately gives states the power to decide how to select their electors. As a unanimous Supreme Court ruling two weeks ago made clear, states may impose punishments on electors who fail to vote in accordance with the laws and thereby the popular vote in their states. With passions very high around the current election and a recent spate of close elections indicating this one is unlikely to be a blowout, debates and discussion around the Electoral College will certainly continue after 2020. And real change certainly is possible. The National Popular Vote Con Compact has already attained more than 70% of the electoral votes it needs to go into force. A handful of key approvals, which aren't impossible, could potentially create significant change in the way we select the president. The strength of passions and the widespread belief by people on both sides that a loss for their side would be catastrophic means that we may see a very different debate after the November elections. Even if November's election results in a very convincing victory, furthermore, the issue almost certainly seems to return to the fore in due time. Today we'll ask and maybe answer a bunch of questions about the nature of the process. And in order to raise them, I'd like to introduce our panel. Your first speaker will be Tara Ross. She's the author of three books for children, for grown-ups. I'm sorry. Well, I sometimes feel like a kid. Three books for grown-ups and one for children, all defending the Electoral College, as well as the single most viewed PragerU video, which covers the same topic. She's also written a book on George Washington's views on religion and public policy. She's a Dallas resident, a retired lawyer, and graduated from the University of Texas School of Law. Our next speaker will be Eileen Reeve. She's the National Grassroots Coordinator for National Popular Vote. She works to mobilize support for efforts that would significantly change the way we elect a president. She's also strongly devoted to environmental causes in both previous full-time work for the Green Building Council, and significant volunteer work for the Sierra Club. She played a key role in passing national popular vote legislation in Oregon. She holds a master's degree in environmental, natural resources, and energy law from the Lewis and Clark Law School. Trent England, our next panelist, is executive vice, vice president of the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs, a conservative think tank in Oklahoma, where he also directs the Save Our States project devoted to preserving the state-by-state -state system for electing the president. He has written a book in defense of the Electoral College and contributed to two other books, one on criminal justice reform. He holds a law degree from the Scalia School of Law at George Mason University. Our final panelist, Patrick Rosenstiel, serves as CEO of Ainsley Shea, a public affairs firm in the Twin Cities. He's a veteran Republican political consultant who worked on the Steve Forbes campaign and has a long history of advocacy for Republican and conservative causes. He serves as a senior consultant to national popular vote and he lives in St. Paul. So thank you for listening to my introduction. And with that, we'll turn to our first panelist, Tara Ross, over to you. So first I wanna say thanks to Eli for hosting the 
discussion in the middle of a pandemic. We persevered. We were still talking about the Electoral College, so thank you. It's an important topic, and I'm happy to be here to talk about it. Um, my job today is, at least until the q and is to talk about the history of the system and why we have this in the first place. So why was the Electoral College founded? Why did the founders give us the system to listen to um, newspaper editorial boards or pundits or elected officials today, you would think that it's all about slavery. And, I, and I've worked out a few quotes for y'all. Um, they say things like, the system is outdated, quote, conceived in sin. And that quote, a lot of it had to do with slavery or quote, it had deep roots and efforts by the founders to accommodate slavery. Or it was quote, born in the economics and politics of slavery in the quill pen era and established to quote, appease slave owning states. I mean, of course, if you hear all of that, you think the system is terrible and we should get rid of it as soon as we possibly can. But the problem is none of that's true, none of it. And so what is really true is that the founders remember a few things that we have forgotten today. Perhaps the first and most important thing that the founders remember that we have forgotten is the danger of simple democracy. They were students of history. They knew about the past failed democracies and what had caused them to ultimately fail and they worried about that. They also looked at their own situation. You know, we, we remember maybe that they fought a revolution for the right to self-governance, but we forget something else that they remembered. Even though they were fighting for a seat at the table in Parliament, they knew that even if they had been given that seat, they would have been outvoted time and time again by the majority of citizens at home in England. It's not always enough to have a simple vote. You can still be tyrannized in such a system. The modern day example of this is that two wolves and a sheep going for dinner, that's not a fair system. Um, it might be purely, it might be democracy, but it's not just. Now, of course, the founders would have been especially concerned about the small states. And over and over again, during the notes of the convention, if you read them, what you see is a divide, a divide between large states and small states. Now, large states were not uniformly slave or not slave, just like small states were not uniformly slave or not slave. The division was not along lines of what they were doing about slavery. The division was between the size of the states. And the small states were terrified that they would get outvoted time and time again by, by the large states. Uh, they made statements like one of my favorite quotes of all time from Gunny Bedford, who was a small state delegate from Delaware. He said, I do not, gentlemen, trust you. If you possess the power, the abuse of it could not be checked. And you would, that would then prevent you from exercising it for destruction. So the founders knew they had to create something unique and special. They couldn't just create a simple up and down vote for everything. They knew that that would not be enough. And so that's why we have a constitution with checks and balances. It's why we have supermajority requirements to amend the constitution. It's why we have presidential vetoes. It's why we have a Senate with one state, one vote representation, as opposed to a House with one person, one vote representation. Our system is all a delicate balance. And it's why we have the Electoral College. So what the Electoral College has done for us as a matter of history over the course of the past more than 200 years is it has provided incentives for coalition building, for encouraging presidential candidates to reach out to a wide variety of voters, to not be over-reliant on one type of voter or one region of the country. And historically speaking, when presidential candidates have made these mistakes and been over-reliant on one type of voter, they're punished at the polls. And that's a good thing. So now we're going to look at me, all of the virtual people out there are looking at me saying, well, Tara, <laughs> that sounded really pretty, but have you read the newspaper lately? <laughs> and so this is what I would say to this. Yes, we are living in a time of anger and division, and it's really ugly. There's no doubt about that. And I would remind you, we have been here before. In the, and in the years after the Civil War, anger, division, presidential elections where there was a winner in the Electoral College that did not match the winner recorded national popular vote. We have done this before. Also in the years after the Civil War, the Electoral College proved its ability to help heal these kinds of divides. If you think about what the situation was back then, Democrats in the South did not have enough electoral votes in reliance only on their state areas. There simply wasn't enough. So they had to try to figure out what people on the other side of the political aisle or what independents, how can we appeal to them? How can we get them, how can we get them to vote for us? Likewise, Republicans, look, they had enough votes in the North and Northwest, but just barely to win the White House. If they lost even one state to the Democrats, then, then they wouldn't win. So they likewise had reason to figure out 
How do I reach a hand across the aisle to someone who is not like myself? How do I remember what I have in common with um, people that aren't like me so that we can build a coalition from that? Now, it didn't happen the first year because human beings are stubborn and perfect creatures that are kind of like now, but it did happen after several elections. And indeed, by the early 1900s, you had presidents like Calvin Coolidge and FDR winning in landslides repeatedly. So the Electoral College, look, some people are looking at the situation now and saying, we're angry, we're divided, we're upset. Let's get rid of the Electoral College, it's awful. I would urge everybody to take a deep breath and instead to study our history, to take a look at how things have worked and to remember why we have the Electoral College instead. Because if we get rid of the Electoral College now, at this angry moment in time, we will never be anywhere else except in this angry place. So thanks for having me. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, with that, I'll turn things over to Eileen to, uh, to offer another perspective. Over to you. Thanks, Eli and Tara. So in almost every election in the country, the candidate who earns the most votes wins. Governors, members of Congress, mayors, on down to members of the water board are elected this way. There's one big exception to this, the one office that serves as the executive of the entire country, the US presidency. Currently, 48 of our states award their electors to whoever wins the most votes in their states. This system, the statewide winner-take-all laws, have led to five of our 45 presidents ascending to the Oval Office without winning over the support from the most number of voters, two of them being in the last two decades. The Constitution leaves it up to states to decide how their electoral votes are awarded, and we at National Popular Vote advocate for state legislatures to exercise that power and change the way their electoral votes are awarded in order to better serve their citizens. Under the National Popular Vote Bill, all of the electoral votes from the participating states will be awarded to the presidential candidate receiving the most popular votes in all 50 states in DC, guaranteeing the presidency to the National Popular Vote winner. This bill only goes into effect when states with at least a majority of electors, 270, have signed on. So this is a constitutionally conservative reform that works within the Electoral College in order to achieve a national popular vote for president while preserving states' rights to award their electors as they so choose. Now, why do we want to reform our current system? Maybe you're unconvinced that whoever gets the most votes is the only metric we should look at. So let's dive into what our current system gives us. Before a general election begins, we know how 38 states are gonna award their electoral votes. These safe states are decidedly Democratic or decidedly Republican before the campaign even begins. Republican candidates don't focus on winning votes in North Dakota and Democratic candidates don't focus on winning votes in Maryland. Both candidates are reliant on winning a small number of undecided voters in a handful of states. In 2012 and 2016, nearly all general election campaign events were in just 12 states. The campaign occurring, occurring in 12 states is bad enough, but in 2012, two thirds of those events were in just four states. And in 2016, two thirds of the general election campaign events were in just six states. In those elections, much of the South, Midwest, West Coast, and Northeast are more or less ignored. Our rural states and our small states are among the most disadvantaged under our current system because they don't happen to be battleground states. And being a battleground state is where power really comes from under our current system. And our electoral system as it is, doesn't just affect who wins the White House. It affects what types of policies candidates propose and how they govern. Dr. John Hudak did extensive research looking at federal grant spending and allocation by the executive branch. He found that swing states received between 7.3% and 7.6% more federal grants than state states, which were worth 5.7% um, more, more grant dollars overall. For an average size state like Tennessee, if they'd been a swing state heading into the 2012 election, they could have expected to receive an additional 300 federal grants worth $60 million per year for four years. The fact that voters in any state happen to be a majority Republican or a majority Democratic shouldn't matter when looking at the number of federal grants they receive. Same thing goes, goes for disaster declaration. Swing states are twice as likely to get a disaster declaration and all the funding that comes from with it compared to safe states. These types of programs should be awarded to states based on many factors, but what's helpful for a particular political party that's in power shouldn't be one of them. When President Obama was running for re-election, he initiated a federal tax credit program to promote clean energy. 
Companies in the battleground state of Ohio got nearly four times the amount of tax credits compared to companies in other states. Now, I have nothing against the good people of Ohio, but I don't think it's a good system when the occupant of the White House can use federal resources paid for by you and I and Americans in every state in order to help them appeal to critical voters during an election campaign. Now, I first got involved with National Popular Vote by advocating for in Oregon, where the Democratic Senate president had been blocking the bill from being voted on for years. Ultimately, we got it passed last year because Republican voters were the votes, excuse me, were the margin of victory in the Senate. This is an idea that's good for all Americans, regardless of their political party. We have bipartisan support and yes, bipartisan opposition on this nonpartisan idea. As our national grassroots director, I work with Democrats, Republicans, independents, and everything in between in over 30 states who are a part of our growing coalition who believe that the current system of statewide winner take all laws is flawed. Thankfully, the framers left it up to the state legislatures to decide how to award their electors. So we can ask our legislatures to exercise the power explicitly granted to them in the constitution and award their electors to the national popular vote winner in coordination with other states. So as to ensure that whoever wins the most votes will become the president. Let's change the system where a handful of voters in a small number of states decides the presidency. Let's change the system where presidents are able to use their influence over federal tax dollars to disproportionately benefit swing states and help their reelection campaigns. Let's change the system where the candidate who less voters voted for on election day goes to the White House because it's not a good a system that gives the president a mandate and it no longer works for the American people. So let's change the system because changing these state laws is exactly what the founders intended for state legislatures to do. We're asking state legislatures to, to fill that duty by determining if the method of awarding electors is best serving their people. I think the answer is that it's not, and we're happy to provide a fix to that problem that preserves the power of the states while benefiting all Americans. Thank you very much for those comments. You almost sold me, so uh, not quite. Uh, good job, though. Uh, and uh, no, I'm very compelling, seriously. Um, so with that, uh, I will turn things over to Trent. I should also mention to people, we'll be taking questions after all the panelists are done through the Q&A feature on Zoom. And uh, so please submit your questions that way. Uh, so with that, uh, over to you, Trent. Thank you so much, Eli. Uh, and thanks to R Street for hosting this program. And uh, I, I want to start by agreeing with Eileen, in part, uh, of course. Uh, I mean, she, she makes all kinds of, I think, obviously correct criticisms of the current system. The problem is a lot of those criticisms apply to a lot more of the current system than just the Electoral College. And to some degree, they're just quibbles with democratic elections in general, right? Consider the House of Representatives. Far fewer Americans live in competitive House districts than even in competitive states in presidential elections, right? Uh, Real Clear Politics, I checked this morning, um, you know, all the 435 seats are, uh, are up, obviously, this November, and Real Clear Politics says that in 339 of those, that's 78%, right? Uh, the, the outcome is a complete foregone conclusion. Now, of course, you're going to say gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is, is the reason for that. Well, fine. Look at the Senate. Look at the United States Senate, right? The, the, same, uh, the same dynamic is present there. 35 seats are up this year. Um, 12 of those are completely safe. 16 of those, uh, 16 more are, are fairly predictable. There are seven toss-ups, right? That's 20%. Now, of course, these are, these are multi-member bodies, but they're more important than the executive uh, in, in that they, they make our laws, they pass budgets, right? We, we accept the fact that some places at some particular times are very evenly divided and other places are, right? And, uh, and that spills over into politics and I don't like it, uh, but I don't have to like it to understand that national popular vote is, it, it would shuffle the deck, right? It would change how campaigns are run, it would change how politics is played, uh, but it wouldn't eliminate the game. Right? It wouldn't eliminate political campaigns. It wouldn't take the politics out of politics. Right? And, uh, and, and that's, that fundamentally is the problem with all of those arguments for national popular vote, that there, there are legitimate complaints about the system that we now live in. 
Um, but if you get rid of the Electoral College and you go to a direct election, which the National Popular Vote Compact is sort of a Rube Goldberg scheme to try to get to a direct election without amending the Constitution, all you do is you shuffle the political deck, right? Um, I mean, ask, ask my uh, friends in Washington State where I grew up, uh, the Republicans who live outside of King County, if they feel like, you know, their voice is going to be heard in the governor's race there this year or the attorney general's race there this year, right? It's a, it's a big single member district. It's a one big winner take all system, which is what national popular vote wants. They want the, the whole country to be one big winner take all race. And uh, the, the reality is that there are lots of people who feel left out, who really are left out in systems just like that, right? So what does the electoral college actually do? What are the trade-offs, right? So, so we understand you can't, you can't take the politics out of politics. The electoral college is a two-step democratic system. Um, and having a two-step system is in the House, is in the Senate, creates some, creates some distortions, right? It allows uh, someone who received fewer votes to win, as happened in Canada, as has happened in Israel and Norway and other countries that, uh, that have a parliamentary system, which is a little bit less democratic than our electoral college. So what, what do we get? What do we get in the bargain? Well, Tara alluded to some of this. If you look back at, at American history, the electoral college incentivizes political parties and presidential campaigns to reach out, to pay attention to broadening their appeal geographically. And it really, I, I don't think there's another single constitutional structure that is more responsible for stitching our country back together after the Civil War than the Electoral College. Because the reality is that the, the Democrats had no choice but to reach out in the North, to reach out in the new Western states. They couldn't win the White House just because they could run up the vote in South Carolina, where they would win, you know, 84% of the, of the vote, right? They, they had to win over some other states in order to win the White House. Um, what do we see today, right? The Democratic Party basically has a, has a choice, right? Either they have to broaden their appeal beyond the big cities, um, or they have to change the rules. Right. And, and, you know, national popular vote is overwhelmingly supported by Democrats who would rather change the rules than reach out beyond the big cities and win people over and, you know, win people back, really, in states like Pennsylvania and Minnesota and Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, I think we can look at this election and as divisive as things are, at least we can thank the Democratic Party for nominating somebody like Joe Biden, who you know, arguably was the most uh, moderate of all of the Democrats, uh, the legitimate Democrats on the debate stage, right? Why did they do that? A lot, of, a lot of that was about electability. A lot of that was about looking for a candidate who actually could reach out to people, right? And that's a good thing. Uh, I, I wish, you know, I, I wish the Republican Party will do the same thing, right? Both parties need to be focused on winning people over, building their coalitions, Right. And uh, the Electoral College does that. It creates that incentive. It also keeps states in charge of elections. It means that we don't have presidential appointees running a big national apparatus to, uh, to oversee federal elections. Our federal elections are actually federal. They're actually pushed out to the states. That's a good thing. It means we never need nationwide recounts. Right. Uh, there are all these benefits by having a distributed system like, like Canada, like Britain, like Australia. Right, our electoral college is, is sort of a, a modification, a slightly more democratic version of a parliamentary system, and it has served us very well, and we should keep it. Thank you so much for those comments. Great to see you as always. With that, we will turn over to our final panelist, Pat. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Eli, and uh, thanks everybody else for sharing. Uh, appreciate our street. Um, pulling this together. Uh, I think uh, my job in the opening comments is to sort of tell the story of a state powers conservative who supports the national popular vote interstate compact. And, um, you know, the truth is, is the reason that I'm a full-throated proponent for the national popular vote, that state-based plan to elect the president by national popular vote, is primarily because I reject any of the redeeming qualities of the current system. I, I, I can't uh, think of a single redeeming quality to the current system being a uh, admittedly conservative stuck behind the blue wall in a blue state like Minnesota. Um, I uh, feel like in my entire political lifetime, um, you know, my vote has gone to support, you know, Democratic electors here in the state. 
And uh, I don't believe the current system forces campaigns to build broad coalitions. I believe that the current system through experience uh, forces presidential candidates to campaign to the interests of battleground state voters. And so uh, I don't believe that the electoral college is a problem. I believe that the state-based winner take all law um, is the problem. And that what it does is it uh, encourages uh, the campaign to get very transactional and by extension American presidents to get very transactional with battleground state voters. Um, I think the reason that the Democrats moved to Joe Biden is because they believe he could deliver the Rust Belt back to Democrats that hadn't voted for a Republican candidate for 24 years. And I don't believe in primaries, we should be focused on who's the candidate that can give us the best electoral college math uh, under the state-based winner take all system. Um, I believe that the founders left the power to the state in Article 2, Section 1 to award electors uh, to advance the interests of the voters and citizens of their state and to participate in the country uh, in, in the best way possible uh, for the entire country. And I just believe that a national popular vote for president does, you know, three things that I'm interested in doing. Uh, I believe a national popular vote for president um, forces the candidates to campaign to all 50 states uh, and the District of Columbia. I believe that it preserves the state power to award electors should there be a desire of each of the states to move away from a national popular vote system. And I believe it makes every voter in every state politically relevant with every presidential election, in every presidential uh, election. And um, I, uh, I don't believe that a voter in the I-4 quarter of Florida should be um, exponentially more important to the American president or the candidates who seek the presidency uh, than a voter in North Dakota. Um, I, I think that if I believe that the current system was protecting small states in some way, shape, or form, I might be in the uh, Ross and England camp, uh, but I can't think of any states that are more marginalized in presidential elections having been a part of them uh, than small and rural states. Uh, and the reason I say that is because I believe events, for example, are proxies for political influence with the American president. And if you look at the general elections in 2008, 2012, and 2016, the 10 smallest states, um, you know, five of them reliably Republican, five of them reliably Democrat, you know, ended up with one post-convention event in the last three presidential elections. Those 10 states have 24 electoral votes. They have roughly 5.9 million people. Now, by contrast, the battleground state of Wisconsin, where I grew up, go pack, um, has 10 electoral votes, right? Um, they have 5.6 million people, and they had 40 post-election events. So they were 40 times more important to the candidates who seek the presidency for less than half of the electoral votes. And I understand that these events and the way the candidates campaign and spend their money is a proxy for political influence. Uh, I had the honor of supporting the Bush administration and enacting their domestic policy agenda after we lost the primaries because I was a Forbes guy. But the truth is, is the one, the top of our agenda was enacting a $1 trillion prescription drug benefit. Um, largest entitlement program since Lyndon Johnson's Great Society at the time. That $1 trillion was a domestic policy effort to lock in the voters of the I-4 corridor of Florida. And anybody who was involved in it knows that that was battleground state politics. Now, I agree with, I agree with Trent. You cannot take the politics out of politics. But I do believe that when it comes to government largesse, the, uh, the, the solution to pollution is dilution. And if we don't take this opportunity to leverage the power under Article 2, Section 1 to make every voter in every state politically relevant in every presidential election, we're going to continue to have transactional politics between American presidents and battleground state voters. Now, just last week, the president himself was talking about protecting Maine's lobster fishermen because the second congressional district is a competitive area of the battleground state map currently. That is not a substitute for sort of the very real interests of voters in North Dakota and Alaska and South Dakota. There aren't a lot of lobster fishermen in most of the small states. 
At the end of the day, what we need to do is we need to set down our jerseys. We need to have a national popular vote for president. We need to force these candidates to campaign to all 50 states because every citizen in this country should be politically relevant in presidential elections. And we can end these false crises around the American presidency by making every voter matter. One person, one vote is not a Democrat or a Republican idea. It's a foundational idea to our republic. And I think it's time we change the state-based winner-take-all system. And that is not an attack on the Electoral College. Thank you so much for your comments. And again, four very compelling presentations. I've thought about this for years and I've learned something new from each one of you. So thank you very much to all of our panelists for your excellent uh, presentations and your thoughtfulness in preparing them. With that said, we'll turn to questions from the audience. Uh, if you have questions, please use the question feature on Zoom uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to put them in, and I will take as many as I can. We will end promptly at four o'clock. So uh, we have a, not that that long for questions. Um, so, uh, let's start with um, a question from Bob Barnes, which is the first question we got in. Uh, and this is really directed towards everybody. How does a winner take all approach on a state by state basis respect the popular vote for president? Why not go the way Maine and Nebraska have? Um, for those who don't know, Maine and Nebraska um, award their people by congressional district, award their um, by, by congressional district. So, uh, Trent, I think you wanted to get a word in. Sure, sure, glad to. I mean, the, the, the challenge with the Maine and Nebraska system is what I mentioned about uh, congressional seats, right? If, if you care about uh, people being in competitive, you know, areas, the, the gerrymandering of, despite the fact that, that any district system is going to produce some areas, in some areas that are set, system of congressional districts, you know, so Maine and Nebraska, I mean, basically Maine is a democratic state that has decided to put one, one elector in play to attract attention. Nebraska is a Republican state that's decided to put one elector in play to attract extra attention. Makes perfect sense for those states, but it's something that the California legislature to, to do um, because they, they feel like they can basically, you know, they, they know where their states are going to go. Well, particularly California, you would, you know, the Democrat legislature would be giving the Republicans a certain number of, of, uh, of congressional seats. And if you look at the congressional seats in California, still most Californians would not live in a competitive political environment, right? Because again, because of the gerrymandering. So I, I think, you know, if, if more states want to go the main Nebraska route, I, I say more power to them. They're still basing their presidential uh, electoral votes based on the votes of people in their state. That's the only legitimate way to do it. Uh, I think, and Justice Kagan's uh, language in the recent Supreme Court opinion, I think suggested the same thing. Uh, but, but I do think there's some limitations to that. All right, uh, Eileen or Pat? Um, I can take, I'll take a crack at it real quick. I mean, I talked about Maine lobster fishermen having all the power with the American president. Under a congressional district system, they'd have exponentially more power. So for example, my home state, of Minnesota, our first congressional district, um, would be a battleground congressional district in presidential elections. Um, I love the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic is fantastic, but I don't think that presidents should be governing the, the parochial interests of the Mayo Clinic. And so what I believe happens with a congressional district system, it takes a bad system, makes it worse, shrinks the number of voters that are relevant in the American presidency. In a world of micro-targeted precincts, uh, with polling, presidents uh, crafting federal agendas that are driven through Congress in order to pander to fewer American voters is not the system we should move towards. It's the move we, uh, it's the system we should uh, move against. And so, you know, as a conservative Republican who's not afraid of my ideas, I'm interested in a system where we're taking our message to voters in all 50 states in the District of Columbia, where we're not transactional 
uh, to micro-targeted precincts and where we're winning the hearts and minds of value-based voters across the country. Uh, and I believe we can do that. And uh, it's in the best interest of the body politic, the country, my state, and the political movement I'm a part of. If I can't sell my ideas to the most American people, uh, I don't think I ought to be elected president. Um, the truth is, I think we get in the most trouble when we start acting like, uh, acting like Democrats, but that's me. Thank you. Uh, Eileen, did you want to get in? I think Pat answered it well. Okay. Tara, anything from you? I'll just follow on what Tara said. I'm happy that every state gets to do its own thing. I agree. States, look, states have great discretion to allocate their electors however they want to. I'm a big fan of that. Also, they have to abide by other constitutional provisions. And the National Popular Vote Compact that has been, uh, has been proposed um, you know, it flies in the face of Article 5, which requires a supermajority of states to approve such radical change to our presidential election system. Um, states do have great power, but they don't have unlimited power. If the state of Texas cannot say, you know, only men get to vote now, that flies in the face of the 19th Amendment. You have to abide by other constitutional provisions. So as far as I'm concerned, if the state wants to try the congressional district, I do think there are handicaps to it as Trent talked about, but if they want to try more power to them, I mean, it's, it's based on the votes of their own state, uh, their own voters within their state, and if they want to try, they should go for it. It's worked for Maine and Nebraska, and maybe some other states would like it too. Thank you very much. Uh, so next question, we'll go to a question from uh, Kevin Johnson of the Election Reformers Network, and it's directed towards uh, Utera and Trent. Uh, would you support a reform that stops the use of winner-take-all but preserves the electoral college advantage for small states and state-based elections? Uh, the reform Kevin is speaking about would award, um, and Kevin can correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, would award um, electoral votes proportionally to the proportion of votes of the state. So fractional electoral votes could be awarded. Uh, I'm not for it. Is, is he proposing a constitutional amendment that would allow a fraction of an elector to be awarded? Because that's a different animal than what we have right now, where you have to decide how to round that person. You know, right. it would be 22.35% of voters say X, and you need to round up or down to the next week to decide who gets, because electors are people. You can't send a toe, <laughs> you send a whole person. So as the system stands right now, Proportional allocation, in my view, is a terrible idea just because of all the logistical hassles that would arise. Um, the other reason I would be against it would be because I'm a big fan of states being in charge of themselves. It is the bedrock of our system. We have got, I mean, the whole last third of my book, not the newest book, is about this, about states' power in the system and how we have forgotten about that. We, we act as if the, the you know, the national political parties and the commission for presidential debates and the mainstream media and the polling agencies and all of these nationalized, centralized entities drive our election and they don't or they shouldn't. States have their own power to do serve their own interests. You know, and you can see, you see a variety of this kind of thing all over this country, at least in the early years of our country. In 1876, Colorado did not hold an election for financial reasons. <laughs> they had just joined the, uh, the union and they, they had held an election for representatives and all that sort of stuff. And they just they, they ran out of time, ran out of money, they just needed to do something faster. So the state legislature appointed the electors. Um, in other years, you see, um, I think it was 1892, Wyoming decided women should get to vote because they thought that was important. And there was nothing in the election system to stop them. They were in charge of themselves. And that was great. The, the reason for doing that was quite funny. They wanted more women to go to the frontier to help all those poor men. <laughs> but they gave women the right to vote. I mean, and throughout history, you see people just, we're going to leave that person off the ballot. We don't, we don't approve of that person. Or just whatever it is. I mean, states throughout history have been really had a lot of flexibility to express their own opinion, their own priorities. And I think that we should consider the possibility that the more that we have centralized things, nationalized things, adopted one-size-fits-all solutions, yes, of course, we're mad at each other all the time, because guess what? That's not how America is built. America is supposed to be a land of diversity and, and freedom of thought and different perspectives. And our entire constitution is built on that. And we keep straying from it. And maybe instead of straying further, we should consider going back to the decentralized plan that our founders had. 
Hey, Eli, I, I need to take a crack at this because, you, you know, the truth is, is I don't think there's anything inconsistent with state powers and federalism related to the conversation that Eileen and I are having. Uh, if everybody opens up their pocket copy of the Constitution that I'm sure we all carry, Article 2, Section 1 has 17 words in it that says each state shall appoint in such manner as, uh, as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. The Supreme Court on a 9-0 vote basically uh, supported the broad discretion of state legislatures to award their electors in any method they choose, including a method of awarding their electors on the basis of the national popular vote. So at the end of the day, the reason we don't pursue a constitutional amendment is not because it's easier or harder, it's because it's not required. The truth is, is you don't have to move to Article 5 in order to change the method that states use to award their electors. Maine and Nebraska didn't need to do that when they went to their congressional district system, and every one of these state-based winner-take-all laws is a state statute. So at the end of the day, the voting question for the individual legislature is, is the national popular vote interstate compact in the best interest of the citizens of your state, yes or no, or in the better interest of the country, and that the individual legislatures will decide. Now, 16 states or 15 states and a single jurisdiction, D.C., enacted the national popular vote interstate compact, fully vetted by legal counsel on both sides of the political aisle, and not once has anybody raised the need for Article 5 of the Constitution. The truth is, is if states want to move to a national popular vote for president because it's in the best interest of their state, it is the most, um, it's the most obvious use of a state power and preserves the power of the state government to provide a check on the president, which is the principle of federalism we're talking about here. So just I want to make sure that we're really clear on what the Constitution says what the interstate compact says, and what the court said last week, which is that states can bind their election electors and that they have the broadest authority possible other than anything that restricts them to award electors. And there's no restriction anywhere in the constitution to awarding your electors on the basis of the popular vote. Now, I would say that Gorsuch and Alito took an even stronger stance in their uh, discernment by um, sort of uh, uh, stake in their case on the 10th Amendment, which was a very strong state power stance, which certainly would allow for the national popular vote interstate compact uh, to take effect. So I think we, we could talk about that court case for a whole webinar, but you know, we, don't need a, we don't need a constitutional amendment to move to a national popular vote for president. You can pass the national popular vote interstate compact and, and we can have one. So Pat, I have a question for you. Since it is in California's best interest to award its electors to the winner of the national popular vote? Why is it waiting for other states to come on board? Why does it need a compact? Why state, does it not it, just do it the, today? If you've read the 888 words of the national popular vote interstate compact, you'd know the answer that the compact does not trigger until there are 270 electors. No, 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 I know, I know that, but if it's because they don't their best interest. Disarm, Tara, they wanna make sure that it guarantees the presidency to the candidate who gets the most popular votes. Because they want, you know, they're not doing what they have to do. You asked me a question, I'm answering it. The policy objective is to make the voters of California as relevant as any other voter in any other state. And the same is true for the state of Vermont, a big state and a small state. And to do that, you have to guarantee the presidency with 270 electors. But that's, so that's a change to the, the presidential system. election system. That's not saying it's in California's best interest to give our electors to the winner of the national popular vote, because clearly they don't believe that. What they think is in the best interest of California is to change the presidential election system to a purely democratic one, the democratic one that was rejected explicitly at the Constitutional Convention. Yeah, so was, that is so different was, than so saying, so oh, yeah, so we want to give our electors to the winner of the national popular vote. That's not in California's okay. best interest unless everybody else does it too. Every method that states have used, other than the state based winner take all system, were rejected at the Constitutional Convention. The only reason the current system, the state-based winner-take-all law, wasn't rejected is because it wasn't even thought enough to be debated, contemplated, or voted on. So the idea that this current system is the founder system is absolutely faux history. Um, but anyways, let's, we can move on. You and I want When they rejected that, they rejected national implementation, for instance, of the congressional district system. They didn't reject any use of it at all. Okay, so if California wants to give its electors to the winner of the national popular vote without a contract, it should go for it. See what happens. 
Are you saying are you saying that interstate compacts are unconstitutional and not? I'm saying the interstate compact is a is one. That of doesn't seem consistent with my conservative philosophy around state powers. Nor rent the interstate compact is an end run around Article 5 because it is implementing the national popular vote system that was directly rejected by the delegates of the Constitutional Convention. So they didn't mean each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature there have made direct a number of electors. They didn't mean that. They just wrote so you're it. Contending, well, you're contending. I, I think if, if, yeah. if I, if, Let me if I can. Uh, Go ahead, Trout. I mean, if I can weigh in, I mean, I, I think, I think, Pat, you owe it to Tara to acknowledge that the founder of national popular vote, John Cosa, um, who, who is, uh, you know, a wonderfully intelligent gentleman, um, called his plan uh, an end run. He, he, he said that to the New York Times back when he was launching the effort. Well, yeah, I mean, it, I'll acknowledge John that. John Cosa would, make would rather, true. John Cosa would, John Cosa would rather abolish the Electoral College outright. At least that was what he said at the beginning when he launched his effort, oh. along with the law professors who wrote up the plan. And, and frankly, that's why one of the law professors who helped develop the plan, uh, Professor Amar, doesn't even really support the, the compact model that you're advocating for because he worries that it would fail in implementation uh, because it yeah. doesn't it, it doesn't synchronize things that, that he believes would have to be synchronized because ultimately he wants to abolish the electoral college. I mean, I just I think we should have an honest debate about that. I mean, I, I, I don't know ultimately what you want to abolish the electoral college to break in a little uh, because we have a bunch of questions and I do want to get to some other fascinating questions we had. This is a very good debate. And I, and I hate to put a. Um, Can I just say it feels much easier to intervene and like you know do all this stuff in person. <laughs> On Zoom, I feel if I'm being you know it feels harder to be graceful. <laughs> no. no, it's I, it's I think it's something we're all getting used to. Uh, <laughs> here's a very interesting question from James Stona, and uh, love to hear from you, Eileen, on this. Um, uh, how will the primary system be affected if NPV were adopted? Surely, it exists as it does because we vote for president by state, not as individuals, don't you think? Yeah, the primary system is in no way affected by the National Popular Vote Compact. Our plan makes every vote equal for the general election uh, and is very specific to that as opposed to the primaries, which are uh, regulated under you know, the DNC and the RNC and a completely different set of state laws. Yeah. I, I think, though, that the question the person is asking um, and I, I don't, uh, Mr. Stoner, if you'd like to clarify in the chat, I think what they're asking is not how will it change, and it obviously doesn't change the law, but, but do you think it will change the way that people run in the primaries? In other words, will they spend much more time in very big states because they know that they matter much more in the general election, for example? No, I don't think so. Not without other rules changing within the DNC or RNC process. For example, if they reordered the, the order of states, that might change it. But I don't think so because they have the entire general election campaign to run an election for the national popular vote. And they, once that campaign is in effect, they will go to every state in the country because every vote will be politically relevant no matter where it was cast. Eli, can I weigh in on that? Of course. I, I think I think the greatest failure of the national popular vote campaign is a failure of imagination. Uh, and I, I think it's, uh, I think it's, I suppose, tactically wise for them to fail to imagine. Uh, because the, the reality is, is that if you change the rules of the general election in a fundamental way, the rest of the ecosystem will reorder itself. And I always think in terms of the ecosystem metaphor, because like Eileen, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, um, learning about uh, how, how ecosystems work and how they change. And if you change some fundamental piece, the whole, the whole thing will reorder itself. And, and this is the concern about, uh, you know, about folks who just say, well, we don't like some of the, the way the current system works. And so surely if we just make some big changes, all the bad things will go away and we can't possibly imagine how anything else would change. There, there could, there, I, I, a legislator advocating for NPV in Nevada last year said, there will be no unintended consequences. You know, I, I just, uh, I think it's a great question. Obviously the primaries 
system would uh, really change in some way, probably to line up with a direct election system, which many folks on the left have advocated for a single national primary for a long time. And for a second, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, look, I agree with what Trent said, and I think we need to consider that if the Electoral College is gone, especially through the NPD Compact, by the way, which would allow a plurality winner to take the whole thing, we can expect to have our system devolve into something that looks a little bit more like France, where they have 10, 12 candidates in a presidential election year. And if you're living in that kind of world, then the emphasis is no longer on the primaries. And who wins the primaries? The emphasis is on getting on the ballot in every state, and, and candidates trying to do that as often as you know, as many ways as they can. There would be, um, you know, it, you're talking about a, a situation where you cannot assume that the two-party system is going to remain stable like it is now. You have to assume you're going to you're going to change into a system that is much more like France, where you win with you can get, in France you can get into a runoff with as little as 19 or 20 percent of the vote. I mean, that's not a great situation. If I could push back on this whole like only swing states matter things for just for a second because I haven't gotten in yet. I reject the notion that the only states that matter are swing states. What I would say is that, okay, first of all, there is no Democrat that wants to go into the election without California's 55 electoral votes in its back pocket. You cannot get to 270 in reliance only on the battleground states. The map does not work. They don't have, there's just not enough there. You have to also have a variety of states and swing states or you know kind of middle maybe i'm thinking about being swing states in your in your mix there but you're not going to be able to get to 270. and in fact the reason that safe states are safe isn't because they don't matter it's because they made up their minds early in the process and that's it and they made up their mind early because they're already pretty happy or already feel pretty well represented by one of the two political parties now and when by the way when a safe state starts to change its mind Everybody knows about it really fast. In 2000, West Virginia flipped from safe blue, and it's been safe red ever since. It got really upset with the environmental policies of the Democratic Party. It was feeling ignored, so it left the party. In, in 2016, Utah was unhappy with both of the candidates, not a big fan of Trump, thinking about voting for a party. And so the Trump campaign dispatched Matt Mike Pence to the state in the closing days of the campaign because the small red safe state of Utah mattered. And you can see examples like this throughout history. Hillary Clinton is probably wishing that she had paid a little bit more attention to her blue ball states that she was taking for granted and that she didn't spend enough time there. And this is what our system does for us. It, it's, it's, you know, I mean, I would say that and there's really no such thing as a permanently safe or swing state. What you have is a situation where it's more like a pendulum swinging back and forth with state allegiances changing over time. So, uh, this is a question directed towards Trent. Um, why do you think NPV is a threat to small states? Uh, I think that less, uh, Sony Bus. I'm totally mangling your name. I'm sorry, sir. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, so I think the, the reality is, if you go to any kind of a direct election system, including national popular vote, if the compact was to was to function as intended, um, you you would. As, uh, as a friend of mine says, you, we would not be the United States of America anymore. We would be the United Cities or the United Media Markets of America, right? Just thinking as a campaign consultant, um, you would look at population density. And I, I mean, I did this running as a state legislative candidate. I, I did this um, in, a, in a seat with 30,000 people, right? You look at where, where is it easiest to go and campaign, right? Which, uh, which rotary breakfast has the most people at it, right? And, and sure, you're gonna try to go everywhere. I mean, you know, I'd love to treat every voter as, as being equal. And in a single member district, mathematically, every voter is equal. But you'd be an idiot to treat every voter as, as being equal because in a world of limited resources, you simply can't campaign that way. You're going to focus more on some places than others. And the reality is, that, uh, that, that rural areas, small towns can only lose, right? They're, they're already under stress. And at least we have a system that provides, you know, in, in the case of, uh, uh, of some places sort of direct representation, I think there are small towns that, that get uh, heard more, um, but I think small town people, right? Whether it's uh, sort of literal or virtual interpret uh, uh, representation, um, do do get more attention from this current system and look the, the 2016 and the 20 uh, and the 2000 election perfect example right one candidate 
uh, was really popular in urban America. And, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton's entire popular vote majority could be chalked up to the state of California and basically to the big cities there. And, and what happened? The Electoral College gave a boost uh, effectively to people who live in rural America and small towns. So um, if you care about those communities, I think your instinct is going to be to support the Electoral College. Um, and, you know, I think when you, when you wade into it further, I, I do think it, in, in general, benefits uh, people who live outside of the population centers, which is one of the reasons why Madison created it in the first place. All right. Can um, I respond to that, Eli? Of course. Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, I think if we look at how a nationwide campaign would be run, we don't have to speculate or look at a state legislative race, right? We can look at how campaigns are run inside battleground states where every vote is relevant to winning that election. If there was evidence for candidates just going to major metropolitan areas and media markets, we'd see it within battleground states. But we look at presidential election data for the last 10, 12, 16 years, and you don't see an overemphasis on those metro areas. Candidates go all over, including to the rural areas and the suburbs, because they know that every vote matters. Across the country, if you look at the 100 largest cities, which goes all the way down to Spokane, Washington, with 200 and 4,000 people, that's 19% of the U.S. population. Coincidentally, 19% of the U.S. population also lives in rural America as defined by the U.S. Census. So you could no more just talk to rural voters or just talk to voters in cities to, to win the election. You have to talk to everyone, especially, you know, the 60% of people who live in the suburbs that are in between and evenly split between Democrats and Republicans. All right. So to some degree, I think that assumes that you're going to have a two-party system in place where it takes roughly half of the people to win. And I do not think that that's going to happen at all. I think what's going to actually happen, as I said before, is the, the race is going to become much more fractured. And then you start to look at a situation like Hillary Clinton and how she got 20% of her vote from New York and California. And, and most of that, by the way, from the big cities of New York and California. And you, and you start to see how easily, and, and that's by the way, when she wasn't even trying for that. And so it, it was the wrong strategy, just like it was the wrong strategy for Robert Cleveland to, to win his, his popular vote victory, but not an electoral college victory in 1888 from only a handful of seven states. Our system historically has prevented that kind of thing from happening. And if we get rid of the electoral college, I don't think we can expect that to stick around. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm curious as to why we think there are going to be bifurcated races in first-past-the-post systems and single-member districts. I mean, we don't see that in the current system in sort of governor's races, for example. And the idea that the current system forces majority candidates to emerge uh, is simply not the truth. Um, you, you, you know, President Lincoln was elected with 39% of the vote. Nixon was a plurality winner, as was Bush. Now, the truth is we know in governor's races since World War II, um, uh, you know, 90% of the, of the races, the winners had 50% or more of the, um, of the popular vote in the state. 95% uh, had 45% or more, 98% had 40% or more, and 100% had 35% or more. Now, if you were really worried about plurality elections, you would recognize that if a candidate gets um, under your math 15% of the popular vote, in just 12 big states under the current state-based winner-take-all system, they would be elected with 12%, 15% of the vote from those 12 states because they have 270 or more electoral votes. So this plurality sort of idea is not something that I view as a problem. I do believe we're set up for a stable two-party system. And if one of the parties uh, becomes irrelevant to a strong plurality of the voters, they're going to go away under any system just like the Whigs did for the Republicans. So. Um, you know, look, we ought not be afraid of a national popular vote for president. There's no reason that every voter can't be politically relevant in every presidential election. And having run campaigns, I never ignore a single voter in a single member district. Um, and uh, I don't know of anybody who runs campaigns that would. So let's just make every voter relevant and um, you know, let's duke it out every four years. And when we win, you know, let's be happy when we lose. Let's get organized and win the next one. That's what I'd say. So I would say this to answer his question. There's a significant difference between someone who gets wins with a plurality of 47% or something, who also achieved a federal majority in the Electoral College. So they did demonstrate their ability, their ability to get a majority. Um, it, 
of electors, which is important. I mean, this is a principle that we use in other contexts of life. For instance, you know, the World Series is a well-known example where you don't see who gets the most runs across the course of seven games. You see who wins, you, you do four games out of seven. And that's because you, you are encouraging a well-rounded team to win, not just a team that, for instance, has a really great pitcher that closes them out one day or, or whatever it is. You're not over-reliant on one type or one player, just like you're not over-reliant on one type of state or one region or one type of voter. So we have a system which, yeah, the reality is doing, but they're, they're pretty close to 50. And also we have a simultaneous federal majority to go with that. That is very different from a system like France's where there's 19 or 20 percent. In France, in a recent election, there were so many people upset with their system that they were able to pass a, a protest vote there as a blank ballot. They had a record number of them. And, you know, if you've got candidates in the runoff who've been rejected by 80 percent of the populace, then, then you can kind of understand why they're upset. You know, and I think we only have to look to the 1992 election to see how easily our system could evolve. I mean, I, I remember that was gosh, was that the first election I could vote in, I think. And, and I remember, I mean, thinking about that and, and people over and over saying, if you vote for Pro, it's a wasted vote. It's a wasted vote. And so, I mean, I didn't vote for Pro in the end, but you know, that was, that was, that is the kind of mindset that surrounds our, our presidential election system right now. And, and, and that would easily go away without the electoral college. So we are at the end of our time, but I will give uh, both uh, Trent and Eileen uh, an opportunity to give uh, closing thoughts. So uh, Trent? Sure. Uh, I think, uh, I think it's, it's back to, to, my, uh, to my comments about imagination. It's, it's strange to suggest that if we change the most visible, the sort of apex predator in our political ecosystem, if we if we change something about the presidency, uh, that that's not going to change the rest of our politics. I just I always think it's it's just funny to hear people say, uh, well, you know, governors' races are this way, and so we can extrapolate that um, if we change the presidential race to be just like the governor's race in Wyoming, we're going to get the same result. But what's more likely is if you change the presidential race. You're, you're going to cause things to change in, in gubernatorial politics, right? Because, you know, what are governors? There are a bunch of people who think they should be president, right? Just, just like the U.S. Senate. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is you look around the world and uh, very few major countries that we consider democratic, right? If you take out Iran and you take out Russia, there are very few major countries that use a direct election system to elect their, their chief of, uh, you know, their, their chief executive, right? Most of these countries are parliamentary. They're slightly less democratic than the electoral college. And they do that for some of the same reasons that we have our system, because it forces a certain amount of moderation, a certain amount of geographic diversity. Um, it incorporates some checks and balances. And all of those are positive things that we should be, be careful about tinkering with, let alone disregarding. Thanks, Elon. My pleasure, thank you. And Eileen, I will give you the last word. Thanks, Eli. Yeah, I just think when, we, when Trent said earlier, we have a lack of imagination with national popular vote. I think to the fact that there are a lot of voting reforms that I would necessarily agree with that members of my team would not. And some of the Republican legislators that have championed this bill across the country wouldn't either. But that's not the question here, right? I like the fact that we can work together on this issue. It's a constitutionally conservative reform of the Electoral College. We're not advocating for abolishing it. We're just saying it should be one person, one vote for this race as it is for almost every other race in the country. Because when you really dig into the details and the implications of our current system, a lot of people are being left out in the cold. And that's not how it should be. And it's up to the state legislatures to exert their power to change that for the betterment of their citizens. All right. Well, thank you so much for an intriguing and energetic discussion, all of you. This has been a fascinating discussion. I would also want to thank the audience for a group of fantastic questions, not all of which we could get to, and an even more interesting and well-informed uh, chat in the sidebar. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending. This Webinar will be available on the R Street webpage at www.rstreet.org within a day or two. If, if all of you, if any of you want to watch and enjoy and revel in the wonderfulness of this of this seminar, with that, I.
thank you very much and hope that you all have a great afternoon. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Eli.